Welcome back. Week two of the Open Classroom on Food System Sustainability, Health, and Equity. Thank you for coming out on such a miserable evening. Ah, you know, we don't have to shovel it, but it's just miserable. And I know the student students in the residence halls are going, yeah, I'm not walking 50 feet. So I value you know, such a good crowd tonight for this. Um, get right into it. Um, you know, we have a great lineup tonight, and, and I want to get right into it. And the theme tonight is what America eats today and why. Um, opening vignette to my class. Um, you know, I mean, for a lot of you of a certain age, you know, you know I was. I remember growing up as a kid in Ohio. My mom was able to stay at home, so she cooked every night. We all sat together every evening for dinner. And if you weren't at the table at 4.30, because we ate early in those days, if you weren't at the table at 4.30, um, you know, tough luck for you. Um, and you ate what mom put on the table. And if you didn't like it, the dog got fed a little bit you know, at the table. But if you didn't like it, too bad. Um, and, you know, and you never ate out that much, especially with five kids. You didn't eat out that much. Uh, and mom was a good cook, because her mother was a good cook. She, you know, and my daddy learned how to cook a bit, so I learned how to cook. Um, and McDonald's was a treat. You went maybe once a month, if you were lucky, because that was pretty expensive, compared to speaking, back then. Um, so it was a treat to go to McDonald's. And finally, in the, in the, in the last little vignette, was we were the only people on our block who had salads with dinner. Because that's what Italians did. <laughs> but we had the salad after the main course. So whenever we went to restaurants and they served the salad before the meal, we would look quizzically at my mother saying, where's the dinner? She says, never mind, that they serve it differently here. Um, so, so we ate a different way, perhaps. At least me, my family. I'm sure there's those kind of stories. Even among the younger folks, there's different stories. So this is about tonight what we eat today and why. And I, we have a blockbuster uh, panel tonight. I have to say, the great thing about being in Boston is I can just sort of go, all right, who's out there? Who could I? And I, invariably, I have more people that I can sort of invite. So some I didn't reach very far for either. So it's like, <laughs> um, our first panel is, and I'm going to go through real quickly on the bios. Louisa Kasdan. Uh, by the way, Louisa, for those of you who heard that five years ago when we did this, Louisa was our opening night. Um, Louisa Kazin is a food writer, founder of Let's Talk About Food, which is a forum on food issues that features a festival each October in Coffee Square. How many of you have been to Let's Talk About Food in Coffee Square? A number of you? Good. Um, that's just the tip of the iceberg, real quickly. I'm not going to go through the whole thing because it's exhausting. Uh, over her career, she founded the Wilson College chapter of the Students for Democratic Society. Um, worked in research and finance, launched a financial marketing firm, organized events for the Boston Visitors and Convention Bureau, was executive director of then called Great Woods Center for Performing Arts, and now called, what is it this week, Verizon? Is, I forgot where it is now, Verizon Center, um, and launched three restaurants. Um, after closing the last restaurant, as he often puts it, they were well regarded but didn't make any money. Um, so after closing the last restaurant, she started to write, become a contributing editor at Boston Magazine. She today writes about health, nutrition, and lifestyle issues for a variety of publications too long to mention, um, including the Boston Globe, Gourmet, Natural Health, um, and I think you still write occasionally for uh, uh, Edible Boston, mm -hmm. Edible Boston and local. Um, she's a graduate degree in political science at MIT and an MBA from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, so it's, and Louise is going to get us started off by talking the big general strokes, which she's noticed over X number of decades. Um, then Maureen Timmons will follow. Maureen, good friend, is Director of Dining Services here at Northeastern, where she worked for the past two decades. Um, Maureen also was a speaker five years ago, first time anybody ever asked her to give a talk about how you feed Northeastern. Um, her responsibilities include overseeing 30 dining locations that serve an average of 20,000 people a day. Um, for her work, she's been honored by Northeastern's Outstanding Service Award. Uh, because of her also, Marie Northeastern is a core member of the Menus of Change University Research Collaborative, which is an affiliation of the Culinary Institute of America and the Harvard School of Public Health, and 25 universities around the country that are using dining services as leverage points for changing the food system and how we eat. Um, and I'm proud to be part of that partnership as well. 
Um, she holds degrees from the Culinary Institute of America, Johnson and Wales University, and her doctorate in, doctor in education from Northeastern University, where she focused her dissertation on food in the curriculum. Um, so go, she'll go talk, it's called, go second, I'll have you know, the perspective of university dinosaurs, what's changed. Anastasia Marques de Salcedo is a writer based in Boston who focuses on industrial food science, micro, microbial farms, and non-munitions military technology transfer. She is author of, an, 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 you know, of a really good book, um, Cam Combat Ready Kitchen, How the U.S. Military Shapes the Way You Eat. And, and, uh, which Bon Appetit, bon Appetit magazine calls a book that makes us realize that the military is basically an R and D, R and research and development lab for what ends up in our kitchen. Which I think is a great way of putting it. Um, and you will be surprised. Um, in her varied career, because and they all have varied careers, which I love about this group. Um, she has worked as a public health consultant and a public policy researcher. Ran a boutique ad agency. Published an English language news magazine in Ecuador among other things, and also probably did bartending. Yeah. Um, yeah. Her work had, I intuitive from the last line of this reason why I intuited this, her work has appeared in the Atlantic or Main Magazine, Savour, Salon, the Boston Globe. She's a proud graduate of the Columbia School of Mixology. As a well as the college. <laughs> it's a New York State, which is a New York State licensed student-run bartending school located at Columbia University. Um, she's She's got a degree in bartending, yeah. which I just... I'll bring to that. Yeah. yeah. No, which, you know, is that... You're not going to do that anymore? Urban studies. Urban studies. Like, you, you, yeah. well, it was on your website. You I know. I was kind of joking. Yeah, I, I have a problem with that. Uh, there you go. So you only go with something like um, So, and she's got a degree in urban studies yeah. as well. So, anyway, that's not as much fun. You know. Oh, no, I know. I know, but it's... Um, in Columbia, maybe also. Um, Andrew Levitt, our final speaker, is founder and CEO of Purple Carrot. The Purple Carrot, a vegan meal delivery meal kit delivery service based in Needham, that launched in October 2014. Uh, like all of us, he has a varied career. Previously, Andy created Health Talker, the first word of mouth marketing company for the healthcare industry. In February uh, in, in 2007, he founded in 2007 and was acquired in 2011. Prior to Health Talker, he spent more than a dozen years in the mainstream pharmaceutical and biotech sector in a variety of roles. Uh, he earned his undergraduate degree at Emory and his MBA, MBA at New York University. He'll follow up at the end, talk about how Purple Carrot and other health except kit services fill a gap in how we eat and why we eat the way we do. So, each of our guests will talk for about 20, 15 minutes, and then we'll do the proverbial discussion. So, without further ado, Louisa Kasdan.
And I said, what are you doing? So I'm making salad dressing. And I said, stop. You can make salad dressing? <laughs> <laughs> and that sort of tells you where I was coming from and where I traveled to. Um, so from that point, I kind of learned to cook. Um, it was fascinating. My mother was often a character in my, in my thoughts. Um, was that when I started to write about food, which I began after I closed my restaurant, my mother said to me, you're such a good writer. Why don't you write about something that matters? <laughs> How did you write about food? And I said, no, well, frankly, not everybody can be on the front page of the New York Times reporting from Afghanistan without leaving Boston. That would be hard. And about 10 years into it, she said to me, you know, there are a lot of articles in the, on the front page of the New York Times now that are about food. Maybe you weren't so stupid. I <laughs> don't. But um, I'm here to tell you that there was a time before food was hot. And food is now, as you know, unbearably hot. And it's also very cool. And it was not hot in Boston for a very long time. I mean, it probably got hot in New York or wherever many other people live. But in Boston for a very long time, the food scene was kind of dreary. It was okay. You know, we had, we had Schlafs, we had the Ritz Carlton, we had Maison Robert, but it wasn't cool. It really wasn't something that people would aspire and say, oh, my son wants to be a chef, or my daughter wants to be a pastry chef. This was not cool. This is something that has happened probably in the last 15 years. And about 15 years ago, uh, when I closed my, my restaurants, and I closed them because as much fun as they were, they were fun, and as many great reviews as we got, and we got great reviews, we really weren't making any money, and it wasn't actually my dream to open a restaurant, it was someone else's dream. So I closed the restaurants and began to write about food and observe the food scene. And I've been observing it pretty closely since then. But when I, when I decided to write about other people's restaurants, I could really be current. There wasn't a restaurant that would open that I didn't know about and that I couldn't visit in the space of a month. I mean, a restaurant would open maybe one or two a month in a busy year, um, more likely one a month, and there would be a lot of buzz around it, and people would be people would think I was very cool because I could visit all these restaurants. Let me just say as a caveat, I never reviewed restaurants because having been in the restaurant business, I could not bear to ruin other people's lives. But I, I, but still, I would go to all the new restaurants, and I had a bunch of reviewers who worked for me, and I was always current. Now, you couldn't possibly keep up with the pace of change and the fascination that's out there in the world about food. It's just, it's mind-blowing to me. And now I'm old, and the idea of thinking of going out to that many restaurants, even the ones I used to go to, but to go with the every new bistro or uh, gastro pub or fine dining restaurant or small plate restaurant or whatever <coughs> would make me insane now, let alone the parking. <laughs> but I, I think that the, the whole tick up in the restaurant business coincided, not surprisingly, with um, the, the tick up with food on television. I mean, it'd be, it would be disingenuous to say that people just suddenly discovered that what they ate mattered. It's that food became entertainment. And once food became entertainment and it was on TV, it became something to pay attention to. I mean, I still remember, I grew up watching Julia Child and thinking she was great. But by the time Emma um, Lagasse came around, you couldn't learn to cook from Emma Lagasse, but it was really fun to watch him. And people watch all these shows, and they watch them like their sporting events, and they're not about learning to cook. There are a couple of shows on PBS which are still about learning to cook, but it's about the excitement of cooking, the competition of cooking, the energy of cooking, and that's all very true. But that is new. And the Food Network, and now, you know, who would have thought 20 years ago there would be two full-time networks devoted to food and cooking and food experiences? Um, I, I couldn't imagine. I really couldn't imagine. But, you know, cable TV has changed our lives in so many ways. You could give us a new president. Um, so now the idea of being a chef and owning a restaurant, or even being a farmer, has a lot of currency. And I have met countless um, members of these professions who are young people, who are not so young people in the last 15 or 20 years. As I said, I started writing about the food business when I decided to close my business, and I thought that it would be helpful to 
keep other people from needlessly going into the food business and losing their shirts. And what I have learned is that you can't stop people from going into the food business because people love food. And once they, once they get into it, the energy that they get is incredible. But it's, it's different now. It's, it's very different because it isn't just about opening a restaurant. We also have the whole eating complex and the cooking complex and the farm-to-table complex and food waste and all the issues that I've been following for the last seven or eight years through Let's Talk About Food. And what I see is it's really affecting the city of Austin where I live and where I do most of my, my energy. Um, one of the things that happened in Boston, and I want to give credit where credit is due, was having a mayor, a long-standing mayor like Mayor Menino, who truly and personally loved food, and grew up in a household much like Chris Basso describes, where food every night was a big deal, where they were cooking and they were eating, and that was his legacy, and he actually really cared about having more restaurants in Boston, having farmer's markets, the quality of the food that kids ate at school. He really, it was on his radar. It wasn't really dim on his radar, it was right on his radar. I mean, one of the last set of things that he decided to do, and he was really a national leader in this, was to create a whole enterprise and, and infrastructure around food trucks. Now, I personally think food trucks are sort of stupid. <laughs> but let me not give you my opinion. Um, because everybody, including my nephew, Henry, decided to get a food truck, which is still in his driveway, which is a good thing. Um, because they thought it was a cheap way of getting into the restaurant business and only losing $20,000 instead of losing $550,000. And for some of them, it's, that's been true. We have a whole bunch of food trucks in, in the Boston area that went from using the, their food truck as an experimental mobile pop-up restaurant, if you will, and now are very successful in books and mortars. And I can only applaud that. But the other thing that was happening as this chef excitement was happening is the farm excitement. And that is fascinating to me because farming is really hard work. But what I noticed, and I've done a lot of interviews over the last seven or eight years with young farmers or people who aspire to be farmers or to work on farms, is that it starts in college. People don't, I mean, there are people who grow up in farming who become farmers. <clears throat> but the average age of most farmers right now in this country is 67 years old is not young, and we should as a nation be very concerned about where the future of our food is coming from. But the young people who want to go into farming and who don't have a legacy in it, there seems to be a pattern, and I kind of smile when I interview them, because every one of them says, well, you know, I went to college and I became a vegetarian, and I joined the CSA, and then I became a vegan, and then I did a summer on a farm, and then I, after that summer farm, I decided to be a farmer. And then I went and I did a year on a farm. And now I'm here to learn more about farming. And I asked them, especially if they've been a farmer for a year or two, are you still a vegan? And they all say, no. No, you can't. Once you're on a farm, you... And I apologize, but <laughs> this has been almost a universal answer for the young farmers that I've interviewed at Stone Barns and other places, that they see the whole harmony of animals in the whole conversation. And that's something else. So out of that consciousness, and out of the, out of the, the CSAs and college campuses, first of all, kids get introduced to vegetables in a way that they may not at home. I mean, it's a very formative time of life, and people are away from home for the first time, and they're not eating what their mother or their father made for dinner. They're, they're eating on campus. And they're trying different things, and they're making their own choices in a very significant way. And what I see is the legacy of that plays out once they're out of college, they care about what they buy, they care about cooking, if they're doing fermentation classes and clinics, they are thinking about, in addition to being a young farmer or a chef, being a brewer or a spirit master, or the young people that I interviewed last fall who were starting a sake distillery in Waltham. But there are all of these careers that are now possible for people who are interested in food. Simultaneously, the interest in health became very significant. And the other thing that we saw is that Americans were getting very fat, and they were getting, get, getting very fat younger. And this became 
suddenly a public health crisis, rightfully so. And as people were noticing that people were getting very fat, they were thinking more about teaching kids to cook, they were talking about soda taxes, they were thinking about the quality of food that we give kids in school, also the kind of food that we feed patients in hospitals. And the whole consciousness was starting to shift that it isn't just about food being cool, it's also food as fuel. And that food as fuel, food as medicine, food as the future of the human body that it enters, became very powerful. And through that, people became very interested in nutrition. They, of course, became interested in dieting. Young people and older people became very conscious of the relationship between um, calorie expenditures. Um, and this is all good, but it's new. It was not a powerful concern 20 years ago. I mean, when I grew up, the, the guru was um, Anna Morella Pei, Francis Morella Pei, and Adele Davis. And they were considered very fringy. One of them, uh, The Diet for Small Planet, is a book I still use. It was the first vegetarian cookbook I ever cooked from. And Adele Davis was considered a kook, but she was a, she was a health food writer. She probably will, if I went back and read it again, was not such a kook. So the interest in nutrition and health and the, and the seeping down into the public consciousness that you truly are what you eat and that food is functional really shifted the way people thought about Simultaneously, they started thinking about um, technology. You know, the first sort of technological thing that people got up in arms about were GMOs. And I really, I can't speak about GMOs because I feel that it's, it's a toxic conversation and I'm not for GMOs or against them. I'm simply not interested in them. But the political energy that came about through GMOs was was totally startling, I think, to the food world. And it has really brought about a whole consciousness of labeling, as have the calorie counts. So if you're buying food that has a label at all, because most of us don't buy everything from the farmer's market, how that label looks and how you look at a label has changed radically in the last 20 years. Um, Boston, in particular, has been a bastion for looking at and studying all these things. Not only do we have a phenomenal cooking and, and um, chef culture, and of course we have a wonderful seafood culture, but we have an academic culture here that is really the, the leading edge of the research in nutrition and public health. This school at Harvard, at BU, at, more, at um, Freedom School at Tufts, really the sort of the, the weight of the public health and nutrition <coughs> community in the country is pretty much centered in Boston. And that's made Boston also very aware as we look at the science of it. And we started to, people started to write about very different things in food. Um, we started to write about knowing your farmer. When I first started writing, it was about knowing the chef. And we write about knowing the farmer, knowing the person who's carrying the spirits, or um, pickling the spices, or doing whatever. It, we're going to do. And I find that whole awareness of the human link between the people who are making food, the people who are growing food, the people who are buying it and marketing it phenomenal. The last thing I want to say is about sort of business of food. And there's been, and this is clear in Boston, a significant interest of young entrepreneurs, and not so young entrepreneurs, who really want to make their fortunes in the food business. Some of them are highly technical. Many of them are software, um, software companies that want to create a more efficient connection between where the food is produced and how it gets to market. But a lot of them are people who are really coming up with products that will change our lives, that will be totally disruptive. Uh, I was on a, I'm a judge on a, a food and ad prize at MIT, and the conference, the thing that I was reading a few days ago, one of the entries, is for creating a power bar made out of algae, a whole source of protein that we haven't thought about. But we have people in this region who are thinking way far ahead about food, and it's, it's been a really great joy to, to pay attention to them. And I want to just conclude with one other thing. I feel that um, I bought a year ago the Boston Public Market open, and I think the Boston Public Market is lovely, it's terrific. And it took 10 years to get it built which says something about how hard it was to get there. And it's supposed to give profile to uh, local Massachusetts and slightly larger than Massachusetts 
farmers and producers, and I hope it does. I hope it fulfills its promise. But a lot of the reason the Boston public market was able to come to, and to finally get built had to do with publications like my good friend, I mean, Bizarre's friend, Edible Boston, and I hope some of it had to do with the work that I've done and other writers have done talking about food, essentially just elevating the profile and taking it from a commodity to a specialty product. And I just want to announce tonight, because I think this is exciting news for me, that Let's Talk About Food and Edible Boston and the new magazine to market and many of the other things that we do, conferences that I do and book festivals that we do, are all joined together in a new nonprofit that's going to be called, <laughs> this is just, we just registered the name this afternoon, which is going to be the voice, of the, the, the food voice. And I think we're going to, you're going to start seeing even more coverage of food, positive initiatives towards food, and I really hope all of you come and help us. And I'm happy to hand the mic back to Chris, or to hand it, hand it to Maureen, another good friend. You everybody at Northeastern so well.